I worship you, Almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, O oh, Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give you praise, for you are my right. Oh! 
There is none like Jesus. Can you say it? There is none like Jesus. There is none like Jesus. Bless his name. There such eternity long but we find there is none like you nobody like you because you saved us when we were so deep in our sins none like you you healed our bodies when we were sick none like you you delivered us when we were bound none like you Lord and we pray that even this day hallelujah that you would perform the miraculous in the lives of those who need a miracle from on high let the hand of the enemy be rebuked let Satan be cast out in the name of Jesus for you know our shortcomings. So forgive us of our sins. Hallelujah. Whatever the need may be, fulfill that need today. And we'll take no credit for anything that you do. But we give you all the glory. We give you all of the honor. For all of the power belongs to you and to you alone. 
and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise and you may be seated. Everybody don't know. Everybody don't know who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. Everybody don't know. Everybody don't know who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. All right, all right, all right, all right. All right, we'll stop it right there. Open your Bibles. I'm so happy to acknowledge the presence of all of our preachers on the platform. God bless uh, Pastor Diola Wells Johnson, Pastor Billy Macklin, our worship coordinators and um, all of our elders who may be on the platform, whether directly behind me or over in the corner, uh, ministers and missionaries. I bless Mother Theta Wells, so glad to see her on today and um, each and every one of you. We want to go to the Old Testament book of Job. Um, as I meditated on what I really should uh, speak concerning today, uh, well, I don't know if it was um, last night or somewhere in the wee hours of the morning, but um, as a word that I heard out of this uh, book that I've spoken from before, but it's been quite some time. And uh, many persons who might have been present even in the past when I um, attempted to uh, speak from this text, uh, by now uh, you need a repeat. <laughs> and those who have never heard it, you, you certainly uh, need to hear whatever it is that the Lord says uh, I have to say uh, on this subject. And we're going to begin at the end of the book. Uh, most of what I might speak uh, concerning uh, will be found at the beginning of the book, but I, I want to uh, read a verse from the last chapter, which is chapter 42 of the book of Job. Do you have your Bibles? Yeah. Uh, it's not that I don't trust you, but I would like for you to hold them up so I could see you. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that's, that's the kind of church I like to preach in. Uh, like when people will bring their Bibles and uh, recognize the fact that the word that is being proclaimed, uh, they are not the words of the preacher, but they are the words of the Lord himself. I was uh, looking at a program earlier today, uh, uh, and the preacher was quite eloquent, but I noticed when he kept referring to various passages, telling his people to make a note on it, I never saw anybody pull out a pen. I never saw them write any notes. And after a while, I looked, and I could tell that uh, Nobody was making notes because didn't anybody have Bibles with them. Uh, and I believe that it is important that we have um, the word with us. Amen. 
I've said this so many times, I, I know I'm extremely redundant, uh, but um, the movie that uh, I saw, television movie, uh, several years ago after the Guyana incident, and they were showing Jim Jones and something about his uh, so-called ministry, and he took the Bible and slammed it down on the floor and said to the people that you, you don't really need this. Say, you don't need this because you have me. And when he said that, uh, something in me spoke and said, that's the reason you need this. <laughs> it's because you got me. Uh, there's no telling where you'd end up. Uh, yeah. And the fact that uh, God has committed this treasure, treasure of the gospel, he's committed it into earthen vessels. You know what that simply means? It simply means that uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ that has the power to save, to heal, to deliver, is not delivered to us by an angelic being. And when I say angelic being, I mean a heavenly angelic being. Uh, of course, uh, it is delivered to you by an angel because I do happen to be the angel of the church. But that simply means uh, the angel is the messenger. Hello, somebody. But when you talk about the angel from the standpoint of a uh, heavenly being, uh, you ought to be so glad that you don't sit here on Sunday morning and then all of a sudden the ceiling opens and here comes that angelic being and he delivers the message and back to heaven. No, no, uh-uh. He's committed this treasure into earthen vessel. In other words, the people who preach the gospel to you, they made out of the same dirt you made out of. <laughs> yeah, same, same thing that you made out of, uh, every one of us. And it doesn't pay any, t any attention to the fact that uh, we're sitting up here with, with our collars and, 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 and all the rest of the elders, they've got on their black and, and I'm, I'm, I'm up here with my r royal, you know, red, purple, uh, the color of the shirt, it doesn't mean anything. It distinguishes an earthly rank within the church but it does not mean that this person is made out of something that you are not made out of. Thank God he has committed the treasure into earthen vessels. But the beautiful thing is he can take that earthen vessel, whether male or female, whether sitting in the pulpit or in the pew, he can take that earthen vessel and wash it sanctify it, filled with the Holy Ghost, give it the power that when the word is going forth, an anointing comes and the yoke is destroyed, not as a result of who it is that's speaking, but the yoke is destroyed by what? The anointing. Oh, thank God for the anointing. Can I hear somebody say, thank God for the anointing? Uh, what did I say, Job 42? I don't want to be too long, but then I'm not, to, I'm not in a rush either. Yeah. Job 42, and just look with me to verse Ten. God bless Deacon Demps. I'm so glad to see him today, man. Bless you. Verse 10 in Job chapter 42. What does it simply say here? And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much 
as he had had before. I, I think, I think, I think we'll just stop right there. Uh, I want to talk about the turning point. The turning point. And maybe you need to tell three or four people sitting near you, you've reached your turning point. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and I, I know that there's someone who's saying, well, I don't see how there's going to be anything in this that's going to be greatly beneficial for me. And yet there are others who are saying, uh, this is just what I need to hear. Uh, and when you say a turning point, it, it is indicative of the fact that the road that, that you're on, the direction where you're headed, uh, is not either the road you want to be on or uh, you are not heading in the direction that uh, you feel you should be heading in. Uh, crossroads. We reach crossroads in our lives practically every day. And, and I don't care what you say. Crossroad is a place where uh, at least two ways meet. You've got some uh, you, you've got some situations where more than two, you, you have a conglomeration of streets and you get there and you're almost just lost because uh, you have options and you have more than one option. And you have to make a decision. When you come to a crossroad, you come to what can be a turning point, you may be... Uh, uh, best to go straight or you may need to turn right or you may need to turn left but it's a decision that you've got to make and you cannot live without making decisions wrong decisions at certain points in your life can mess you up for life uh, I'll never forget when I was just a, a, a teenage preacher uh, the late Bishop L.C. Page from Los Angeles, California. He was the chairman of the um, evangelist board in the Church of God in Christ. And I was the youngest thing on the board because I was probably no more than uh, 17 or 18 years old. And naturally, some of the older evangelists were trying to influence me and different directions. And uh, Bishop Page, he referred to me somewhat as his Timothy. He said, you know, he was like Paul, and he said, I, I, I look on you as my Timothy. And Timothy, I, I need to talk to you. And went into the office, and he uh, said some things, and there were some things that he didn't say. He said, I've been watching you. God's given you a great gift, and anointing is on your life. He said, but you got to watch some of these people. They're preachers, but you got to watch some of them who are trying to get you to run with them. Uh, he said, because the fact is that uh, you can pick up habits in your youth, in your teenage days, and in your youth, and you'll never be able to get rid of those habits for the rest of your life. He didn't want to come right out and tell me that some of the folk that was dancing and speaking in tongues uh, was also smoking and drinking, and he didn't want to tell me that some of the guys who were running together uh, had relationships that were uh, a little bit more than just a, 
casual uh, friendship. He, he didn't want to tell me a lot of things other than to watch. <laughs> and and you've got to come to a place, even in church, you, you, you can get messed up making the wrong decision, even in church. And, 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 and don't pay any attention to what people necessarily claim. Watch their conduct. Are, are they preaching one thing and living another? Uh, are they trying to adhere strictly to this word that they are preaching to others? Because Paul let us know of the possibility that after I have preached to others, uh, then it's possible that I myself can be a cast away. Uh, I don't want to preach to others and then be a castaway. Yeah, I've been running this, this, this journey on this road too long now. And uh, if, if it's a turn that I've got to make, when I get to that turning point, let me always turn right and go straight. <laughs> Amen. As we look at the book of Job, we look at an individual. Now, I, I know and I've been told this, uh, even one of the great theologians within the church said that uh, Job never really existed, that there was never really a man by the name of Job, uh, that this is just a story to make some illustrations. Uh, I said to that theologian, I said, well, you know, I have not matured to that level as yet. And I guess I, I cannot get beyond that because when I opened my Bible to Job, the first line says, there was a man <laughs> in the land of us whose name was Job. Now, if you, re if, you know, if the Lord were to somehow remove that line, then I could believe that Job never existed. But the fact that uh, it says there was a man, uh, I believe that he actually existed. I, I will admit uh, there's nothing known about him uh, as it relates to uh, what uh, particular tribe he might have been in, uh, what nationality he was. The uh, truth of the matter is, um, no one really knows who wrote the book. It is believed that Moses was the author of the book of Job and that it was written somewhere maybe around the year 2000 BC, that he was a good 500 years or so ahead of Abraham. But uh, regardless of who Job was, there were some things that happened in the life of Job that uh, I believe are worthy of us taking a look at. You still have your Bibles open? First of all, the thing I want you to look at is the fact that he was a man of means. He had tremendous assets. Verse 3 in chapter 1, I believe, will verify that. Come on and read that with me. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, and 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. Now, now you see, the fact that the man was wealthy, and basically in that day, uh, you know, people didn't have the, uh, the monetary system that we have, but their stocks, uh, and when I say stocks, I'm talking about livestock. Uh, that kind of thing determined the wealth of a man. But what we will read a little bit further down in the chapter happened to a man who was a man of tremendous substance, a man of great uh, means, a man who had great assets. Don't you ever get it in your mind 
that uh, the thing that's happening to you is because, you know, I'm just poor, pitiful me, and uh, yeah, such and such a person, they live on the hill, and they've got this big old house, and they've got this, and they've got that. Let me tell you, it does not matter how wealthy one may be. A turning point will come in your life. No need in being envious of what someone else has because trouble can strike anywhere. Trouble can strike in the house of the wealthy just like it can strike in the house of the poor. Uh, truth of the matter is the higher up you go, the, 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 the further you've got to fall. And the, and the longer that fall is, the more damaging uh, can be the hurt. I hope I'm not losing anybody here yet. Well, let, let's observe something else about Job. He is the man that, uh, as I said, in spite of his, um, his assets, his substance, he ends up having problems because he also ends up losing his assets. Uh, skip down to verse 14. And let's just read verse 14 through 17 and see what happened to him. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, the oxen plowing and the asses feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain thy servants with the edge of the sword, and I only escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now, now what you see here is that all of these uh, assets that he had, group by group, each thing that he had was taken away from him. You can lose it. Don't get it in your mind that you can't lose it. Uh, some folk think that once they get to a certain point, I uh, got it made now. Honey, let me tell you the only way you have it made is if your total dependence is on God. If you depend on him, you may not have a dime in the bank. But every morning, he'll give you your daily bread. Every day, he'll load you with benefits. But when you are depending on things, and, and actually, that's, that's where we are now. The, the, the intent, the intent of what is happening now uh, when you hear the terrorists talking, the whole thing is their desire is to change Western society. We in, in, in the Western Hemisphere are presumed to be the wealthy ones. Just, just listen to this for a minute. I'm not going to stay there that long. But when you look and see what is happening in Iraq, what you see what's happening in Iran and in Afghanistan, when you see what is happening in that portion of the world, 
money is something that a very few people over there are even exposed to. And they are determined, because now 9-11 happened to the Twin Towers. The Twin Towers were a symbol of uh, the wealth, not only of this nation, but the Western Hemisphere. And every time they go after a target, they're going after some kind of a target that speaks against our presumed wealth. And if you haven't learned yet how to, let me use the word, rough it out sometimes, <laughs> you, you, better, you better start learning. Uh, some of us won't be here. Some of us may be gone on, and uh, you that's so rough and tough, you'll have to fight uh, against that element when the thing comes. But believe me, a change, a change is going to come. I'm not saying that they're going to succeed with what their intent may be. But uh, right at this point, uh, our enemies have united, and more and more of them are uniting. And they do not see the United States of America as we see ourselves. We look in the mirror and we see ourselves as this uh, uh, great nation uh, that has a thriving economy and that uh, everything is well. They look at us and they see what they call the great Satan and all that they want. And of course, um, here we are back again battling with uh, uh, North Korea. Where was it? In the 50s when I remember uh, that the uh, war was between North and South Korea. The dividing line being the 38th parallel. Some of y'all remember that. I'm even looking at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. Some of you. And here we are now. Uh, I, I don't know if those guys can shoot straight, but they, they, they sure got their march. Never seen, a, never seen anybody march like the North Koreans. <laughs> this world is changing. Things are changing, and don't, don't you think for a minute that, that you're going to be an island under yourself, and while everybody else is suffering, you won't have anything to worry about. Your trust better be in God, and nowhere other than in Him. Let me go just a little bit further here. Not only did he lose, and... and, and uh, I'm just doing a little skipping around here, but if you have never taken the time to read this book, you need to take the time to read the book. See, all of this happened as a result of the fact that at the beginning, and it talks about uh, the man in the land of us whose name was Job, it, it talks about him being perfect, upright, fear God, assureth evil. Uh, but it also talks about him coming into the presence of the Lord. He had to come into the presence of the Lord at a time when the sons of God came together and God gave him permission. See, the Lord bragged on Job. Satan, what you doing here? This is a congregational meeting. This is for the saints. This is for the, the, the sons of God. Uh, he said, oh, I've just been going up and down in the world, you know, to and fro, just. My dad, <laughs> I used to love to hear my dad preach on this subject because he said Satan didn't tell God the whole truth. He said he was going up and down in the earth, but you have to go to Peter to get the rest of the story. 
And Peter lets us know what he was doing. You know, that, that Satan is like a roaring lion walking to and fro in the earth, but he's seeking somebody to devour. He's not doing what you all do when you go on the track. He's not taking exercise. He's, he's looking for somebody to, to destroy. Yeah. And the Lord said, have you considered my servant Job? You know, he's perfect. He's upright. He fears God. He assures evil. And, and, and the, the devil says to the Lord, the only reason he's serving you is for what he can get out of it. You've got a fence. You've got a hedge around him. Now, you think about that. Satan says the only reason that the 2,000 or so of you that's in here this morning, this afternoon, that the only reason you're here is for what you can get out of it. Now, you know, Satan is a liar. Hmm? Don't make Satan, the great liar, tell the truth. I, I wonder sometimes, uh, you know, I wonder sometimes when we only want to go to church to hear about prosperity. If, if, you know, if the great liar is telling the truth, that the only reason that you're here is for what you can get out of it. Satan told God, said, now if you move the hedge, I'll make him curse you to your face. And the Lord wouldn't move the hedge. But what does he say? He says to him, he's in your hands. He said, now you, you can move the hedge, but don't touch his flesh. God gave Satan permission. The hedge represents a fence. The fence is not the house, but the fence is, is, is the, the, the petition around the house. And when the devil started doing all of the stuff that he did, he was working on the hedge. And the only reason he was able to work on the hedge was because God gave him permission. Don't think that the devil is able to totally destroy you. Satan has to come into the presence of the Lord and get permission and get consent from God to do whatever he does. And when he comes, God will give him a certain amount of permission, but God draws a line. The Lord tells him, you can work on the hedge, but don't touch the man. Now, you may have lost your car. You may have had to move out of that house that was too big for you, that you didn't have no business buying in the first place. That there may be some things going on in your life, but don't think Satan is able to destroy you. He can't go any further than God allows. The hedge don't have to be nothing more than, than, a, than a scratch mark on the ground. But if God draws that line, he dares Satan to cross it. So what are you scared of? <laughs> Hallelujah. He can't go but just so far. So this is why all of this is happening. Simply because God gave Satan permission. But the devil, as usual, was wrong. After all of the stuff, a man's life consists not of the abundance of the things which he possesses. I wish you'd tell somebody, my life is more than stuff. Well, you, 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 can't, you can't really say that if you don't mean it, but my life is more than stuff. Thank, thank God for the stuff he allows me to accumulate, but thank God that my life is more than stuff. It's that. Uh, 
But it's not only just that the hedge was removed. Satan was wrong. Chapter 2, look at it. Again, that was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence cometh thou? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. The Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth, perfect, upright man, one that feareth God, assureth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou moveth me against him to destroy him without a cause. See, everything that happens to you, that's not a cause. Yeah. Some people want you to believe that everything that happens, if it's bad, it's because of something bad you did. But that's not what the Lord says. Verse 4, Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. Put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh and he'll curse you to your face. And God said unto Satan, Behold, he's in your hand, but save his life. And see, here the Lord lets him get closer. You move the hedge, and he didn't change. So now I'm going to let you put your hand on him. I'm going to let you afflict him. I'm going to let you make him sick. I'm going to let you really, you know, but even though you're going to be able to touch him health-wise, don't you dare take his life. <laughs> uh. You ought to tell somebody, you may be sick, but the sickness is not under death. Your life is in his hand. Oh, my God. The enemy wants you to believe every time you sneeze. Uh-oh. You won't be here much longer. Oop, I, I, I felt a knot where there shouldn't be one. You're on your way out of here. The Lord told Satan, I'm going to let you touch him, but his life is safe. Oh, I, I think I wish, you know, I just wish you'd stand up and maybe tell about five people around you. Your life is secure in his hands. <laughs> Your life is secure in his hands. Oh, I'm going to have to quit this. Uh, believe that and go on back to your seat and give God some praise here. I, I don't have... Hey, thank you. I don't, I don't have the time, I don't have the time to go into another sermon. But, but, you know, I, I wish you could see the difference between Job and David. See, the book of Job starts saying there was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and this man was perfect, upright, one that feared God and assured evil. But see, this wasn't the way it was <laughs> with David. If I could sit down and talk to David a few minutes, he'd say, Job was a good guy. But, but he'd also say, but, but I was a mess. And, and, and then I turned to Psalm 119 and verse 67. 
And I hear David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. And I skip down to verse 71. He has to say, it, it, it is good for me. He, he said, I was a mess. I wasn't perfect. I wasn't upright. <laughs> I didn't have no fear of God. I didn't assure evil. He, he had to take me through some stuff. But, but when he got through taking me through, <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Yeah, before my affliction, I went astray, but now I kept his word. And, and when I look back over it, I don't care how nobody cursing and say, you know, the devil this, the devil that, the devil the other thing. Oh, David said, it's good for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of the stuff he's taken you through, you wouldn't be who you are if he hadn't taken you through. Glory to God, glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, let, 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 let me, let me, let me, let me. Oh, hallelujah. Let, let, let me close this out. With all the stuff that happened with Job and, and, and the thing about it, I, I don't have time to deal with the whole story, but when, when you get to, to somewhere over here in that second chapter, uh, Job's friends, three of them, they, they decided that, that we, we better go and check on our sick buddy. The sickness had worn him down so, and till when they saw him, they didn't even recognize him. They looked at him, and when they saw him, they fell down on their knees and the, threw dust on their head, and, and they wept, and, and it took them seven days before they were even able to talk about what they saw. And, and, and when they looked at Job and uh, saw the condition he was in, uh, then these three wise guys that always got an answer for everything God does, uh, they began to let him know that, you know, uh, this wouldn't be happening if you hadn't messed up somewhere. Uh, God is punishing you because of this or because of that. Uh, but uh, Job, after he listened to all three of them, and, and that's what most of the book is about. It's about Job's friends reasoning with him and telling him, uh, how can you claim to be so righteous and to be so holy because even the heavens are not pure in his sight. Uh, he even charges the angels with folly. And you got the nerve to, to, to act like you think you better than somebody else. And when they got through preaching, and, and let me just tell you, uh, when you go to, to visit folk that are sick, pray for them. They don't need you preaching to them. They, they don't need your sermon. You don't need to give them a sermon every day. But all you need to do is just keep on praying and, and let God in his own time and in his own way make whatever changes that need to be made. And when those guys got through talking to Job and telling him all about God and all about himself, uh, Job had to admit that you know, I cursed the day that I was born, and, 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 and I wish I hadn't ever been born. And he got all messed up and tangled up in his stuff. But when he looked at his friends, he realized that they were in worse shape than he was. And instead, instead of him talking about himself, instead of him turning introspectively, 
And, and you know what it is that when you get in real trouble, when pain is in your body, you can't really think about nobody but yourself. But the thing that Job did, he realized that with all I'm going through, you guys are healthy. You haven't lost anything. Yeah, you are in good health. But I just want you to know that you the need the one that need prayer worse than I do. And Job decided to get on his knees and pray for his friends. And when he got through praying for his friend, after a while he felt health coming into his body. God turned things around for Job when Job took his mind off himself and started praying for his friend. I wish you'd tell somebody, don't worry about yourself, but pray for your friend. And while you're praying for them, God can turn things around. Turn it around! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And, and the beautiful thing about it, I only read verse 10 out of chapter 42. But, but I want you to grab your Bible, not now, but when you get home. And I want you to read verse 10. But don't stop there. Go on and read verse 11. And go on and read verse 12. And not only did God heal him, when the Bible said God turned the captivity, it simply means that God healed him, that God turned things around. He was on his way to the grave, but God turned them around. He was on his way, poor, but God did something that he'll do the same for you. Not only did he turn things around, but he gave him twice as much. He gave him, he gave him twice as much. I wish you'd tell somebody he'll give you double for all of your trouble. Oh, he'll turn it around. He'll turn it around. I, I, I'm going to have to go to my seat, but I want you to know that somebody that I'm looking at now, you're out here in this audience, and you don't know how close you are to God turning things around for you. Lift up your head. God getting ready to turn it around. Drive a tear. I, I, I just got to tell you what the Holy Ghost said. Dry the tears from your eyes. Lift up your head because God's getting ready to turn it around for you. Turn it. Hallelujah. 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 Been on poverty's road long enough. Woo! You've been on your way down long enough. You've been a pessimist long enough. God is turning it around. Hey, thank God for Jesus. Go on and give him.
him some praise. Give him some praise. every one of you in here if there is somebody I want you to get this if there is somebody they may be here they may not be somebody you've been carrying something against for a while. They may not even know it. Thank 
But you know, they have in the spring what they call spring cleaning. And in spring cleaning, they throw out all of that junk that has accumulated. I don't care what they did to you. Don't care how long ago it was when they did it. They may never again want to have anything to do with you. But I want you to find somewhere, whether it's down front, at your seat, and I want you to take your mind off. Take it off the bills you can't pay. Take it off of your doctor's report. Take your mind off of anything that pertains to you. And with everything that's in you, I want you to begin to pray for somebody else. I want you to pray with everything in you. And if there's nobody that you know you need to get something straight with and nobody that's on your enemy list, then turn to somebody that's close to you. Grab them by both of their hands and pray for them. But I don't want you to pray for yourself. I want you to pray for anybody but yourself and see what God's going to do in your life. I want you to start it right now. Mm. 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 I saw the light in you, Jesus. Ooh, Hallelujah, hallelujah. When that load drops off of you for that other individual, then begin to give God all the praise that you can. Thank you. Woo, thank you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah.